So our next pre uh, presentation is on uh, habitat modification and uh, species-specific pest control uh, products can reduce pest control costs by Tom Unruh, his USDA ARS uh, lab in Wapato, Washington. What, what Nick presented at the beginning when, uh, earlier today said something about conservation biocontrol being the most important part of biological control. Well, I agree with him 110%, and that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about. But I'm taking a slightly different angle on conservation biocontrol than what what Vince was just talking about. I'm really trying to look at at the impacts on um, the activities of the predators and parasitoids in the system. And today is all all going to be about that. Uh, my talk. So conservation biocontrol has some of these as main components: uh, provide alternate habitats for overwintering or off-season. Uh, um, um, relaxation for natural enemies, uh, provide alternate hosts and prey for natural enemies, uh, uh, reduce cultural practices that disrupt biocontrol. A, a good example of that is dust abatement, and improve pesticide practices to miss to reduce disruption of, na of natural enemy activities. And when I say natural enemies, I mean parasitoids and predators of the pest. Right? So in central Washington, we have an interesting challenge and benefit. In our, in our production areas. One of the, the um, um, benefits, of course, is our, our xeric uh, conditions with, with available water because of our rivers allows us to escape a lot of pests that the folks in the east suffer with. And one of the, the disadvantages may be that we don't have a lot of beneficials be, uh, coming into some of our settings where we grow crops and um, and providing econo uh, um, uh, ecosystem services. Uh, but we also have growers that grow in riparian settings and or near riparian settings. And there we have predators or parasitoids being exported from these. And I'll be talking about the lower one case next, where a parasite comes out of roses and, and works on predators. Here's a comparison that was done by Jay Bruner and his student uh, quite some time ago, Robin Rathman, that shows the type of abundance and species diversity you get in those dry habitats, uh, our shrub step habitats, versus what we see in um, our um, near riparian, in ri more riparian settings. And you can see there's a lot more in the graph in the top right in the riparian settings, and particularly in mid midsummer. And that the, this on the in the table in the bottom. You can see that there's a quite a big difference in the in the types of species that are coming in, and the sage uh, is really heavy with spiders. Very notable. So I'm going to first talk about leaf rollers and and a conservation biocontrol project I've been working on for 20 or for 10 years. Seems like 20, um, and that's uh, the uh, biocontrol or improving biocontrol of our leaf roller complex in apples and pears and cherries. There are many species that attack these leaf rollers, but they normally arrive to the orchards too late to do good work, and not adequate work to prevent us from having to put specific insecticides at them. Now, here's the area we're going to work in, and it's, it was intentionally designed to have shrub step and riparian zone boundaries at both of those two areas. So we could look at the effects of orchard edges and distances from those uh, on, um, on the activity of the parasitoids. This is only one of two years where we studied it, and that's all I'm going to show you. But what you see in the left and the middle columns at these two sites, the north northerly one on the top and the southerly one on the bottom, um, is that there is very little parasitism. Be, and that would be the white part of the circle that you see. And most of the parasitism you see is in black or blue uh, in the pie charts. And the black are tachinid flies, and the blue is one uh, species, a group of parasitoids called the pantheles. Now, what you see in the third column, so that's spring in the first column, excuse me, summer in the generation in the second column. And then what we have here in the, in the, in the third column is, is the fall. There are no leaf rollers that support these parasitoids in our orchards in fall. 
But if we put out sentinel larvae, which all this was done with outputting of larvae so we could collect the data, uh, if we put out sentinel larvae in fall, we see the parasites pretty much attack all of them. And they're basically, in, in my, uh, my uh, interpretation, is they're all looking for overwintering hosts. And you see particularly here this giant upswing of this red color, that's the parasite Copacolypius florus. And you only see it haphazardly here, and as I'll show in a minute, mostly you see it near riparian zones. So this is where we see the effect of spring and summer, and then you see everything uh, blows up in fall in terms of the parasitism. And all of a sudden, Copoclypius, which is now here in the black bars, blows up in that, at that time frame, Look, presumably looking for an overwintering host. At the same time we were doing no study, we were studying a few blocks where we had a, a roses a, where Copoclypius we knew was overwintering uh, on, on a, on a non-pest leaf roller and looked at the effect of parasitism in, uh, by Copoclypius in blocks adjacent to that setting. And this is the second year of the two years studied there. And what you see is parasitism by Copoclypius, which is that's all that's shown here, gets extremely high in these blocks. So you first we're right in the roses and it's high. And then the wind breaks just between the roses and the orchard and all the rest of that is orchard. And you see at least partway into these orchards, it's, it's approaching 100%. So we, we know now, and it will describe more, that it was really important for this, uh, uh, that's an important overwintering site. This isn't something that would happen without, without it there. Um, and this is the community that explains this biocontrol. There's the parasite, Copoclypius floris, attacking an ob oblique banded leaf roller. The, the uh, overwintering leaf roller, which is a not, not a pest in our system, is the strawberry leaf roller. And it, it is a pest for some of these strawberry growers. Um, but it has, it has uh, naturalized on our, um, our um, um, multifloral rows in, in our habitats in riparian settings. And uh, that's a, it's a, it, it is a larvae down below, and that's what Copoclypius does to the host. Okay, so from these observations, we hypothesize we could increase parasitism near to orchards by actually planting gardens. And our gardens looked something like this, various sites. A lot of this was put in by growers and continues to be put in by growers. Um, and these are the sort of trees we would use to, to study um, uh, parasitism in orchards by putting larvae on them and putting them out in, in the orchards. And here's a, a one that capsulizes one of our, the year after we put in ro uh, the roses. So that, that's what the parasitism looked like in, in uh, July, uh, where we were actually a month earlier in, in uh, the next year in 2001, and you see a big upswing. There, there is multiple dates and two areas where we have this, this sort of information, but this capsulizes the message that we have a tr tremendously uh, more contribution by this Copoclypius, thanks to the planting of a garden uh, right above this. This is a 100 acre block. And that's what a history of that block looks like over, th over three years, starting um, two years later and growing for three more years. And we see that persisting today. So then we wanted to put kind of the last nail in the coffin and demonstrate for any doubters uh, that these things are coming out of the roses. And also to understand, understand maybe how far they move and how big these plots have, will have to be. This is work that was done in Vince Jones's lab, as it says. And, um, I didn't put up the names of all my collaborators in this because I wanted them to have enough deniability that they didn't have to you know, get caught up in it. And then um, what they did is covered the roses with a netting and dusted it with soy flour, and then they collected the parasitoids off the trap, as you see there, and they did uh, an enzyme assay to detect that, that uh, soy flour. And what you see marked in red is how far they, they moved. The inset is 2005. The, the background is 2006. And we only went out to 100 meters, and they, they were still going. So we really don't know the farthest distance they could move. But we did make the case that they at least visited and probably came out of these roses, right? Um, 
So parasitism by C. florus is enhanced by these rose and strawberry gardens. Relatively small gardens can have a big effect. Um, we, I, this is not discussed here, but I believe providing uh, strawberries helps because they're more productive of the strawberry leaf roller than our roses are. Um, strawberry leaf roller, for anybody that's coming from Europe, is, is common in Europe, and it has been considered wild. It's been considered a host from coming uh, in wild uh, strawberries near orchards in, in Holland and also in Germany, but they haven't done any, any of this sort of manipulation. And roses and strawberries should be separated from one another because the roses win. They will overgrow the strawberries. So that's the first half of my talk. How am I doing, Shay? Okay, well, I'll have to go faster. This is the last third of my talk. Okay, so codling moth is, we think a lot about natural enemies in our secondary pests and not so much about codling moth. But codling moth does have lots of natural enemies. And the works that you've just been seeing uh, suggest that maybe we can get, if we conserve those, we can get some activity out of them. In, in about a, a decade ago, I did this study at, at two orchards, and they were organic, uh, an organic pear and an organic uh, apple orchard. And you see, we had very low parasitism, but up to 30%, almost 40% in the, in the ground cover predation on, on sentinel codling moth we'd put on bark flakes on the ground or in the canopy or in the trunk. And now we, I've gone to studying who's doing this predation, and I'm using a molecular gut content analysis, so we basically amplify codling moth DNA out of these predators when we pick them up. And this is a collection of studies we're still finishing off, but what you can see is in the case of the spiders up top, out of 780 spiders, 8.2% 8 of them, were positive for codling moth. In 2009 and 10, we didn't look at them. In 2011, we have very little data as well, and it's not been analyzed. It, for the carabid beetles, which is the second one down, we, we out of 200, we had 8%, et cetera. Um, and we had much less in 2011 because we were working in orchards that had almost no codling moth in them. Um, and the same pattern persists for the um, for the others, the other thing that was kind of a surprise to me was the earwigs on the bottom. When they were in, when their bands or bundles put in these trees, the earwigs liked to aggregate in them, and we had 15% predation of the collie moth in these bundles. Uh, but even in pitfalls um, in, in apple orchards that we studied in 2011, we had a, a, um, a pretty good uh, amount of predation. I don't really understand why, there's that difference at that block, but that's the case. And this is a this has not been updated, but the patterns are the same because we have about five times more samples. But what we see here is is the predation by the spider community, which is much larger. Um, we have about 14% predation, and that means these things that we're preserving with less pesticide use are important. So those are two studies that really talk about. Um, conservation biocontrol and what they might add to our, our efforts. We also have done work to look at how abundant these things are. The carabids alone we're finding at some of these sites that are using very soft programs that we have more than one carabid per meter. That, mean, that would mean 20 or so of them are maybe around a tree. And the collie moth coming down there uh, really have to be lucky to get past that, that, sort, of, um, that sort of gauntlet. So finally, I'll very quickly talk. This is not my data. It's Betsy Beers and her student, um, Lissando Contijo, that they've given me uh, the permission to present this. What about putting in ground covers? Um, they've got recent results that suggest that this alyssum, um, sweet alyssum, has been, is very attractive to surfeit flies, which are great aphid predators, and particularly great predators in the uh, woolly apple aphid. And you can see that comparison between other species of plants. And there's the difference in um, the number of adult surfids they see in, in the alyssum versus this is just caught by sweeping in, in control uh, um, trees that aren't, aren't embedded in alyssum. And then when they look at the colonies in the predator complex, you see that 60% are surfids and uh, a, a mixture of the others. 
Now the surfaces interact um, very, very well, but there is some antagonism actually between Aphelide and Smalley in the surfaces, but not terribly so. Together, the two of them are more than one alone. Um, so the conclusion from our ground, those ground cover studies and mine is that sentinel exposures suggest 30% predation on Kalimov. Gut count, 10 analysis show that many species contribute to this predation. Floral subsidies provided by alyssum are attractive to surfids, and I just think overall this means biocontrol can be a much more important part of IPM, both direct and indirect pests. And I could add two more slides on the pesticides, but I don't think we need them. Thank you very much. <laughs>